knows where it came from or who it will visit next. Nancy, there's something wrong with you. You're imagining things. Nightmare. Hello, and uh, welcome to uh, another episode of Bomb Squad Matinee. Uh, I am your host for this evening on a spooky Halloween edition. Uh, I almost said Special Agent Joseph Henry Vrenick, like this is the fucking X-Files videos, but no, this is, uh, I'm just Joseph Vrenick. Uh, but today I have with me... I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. Hi, I'm Fredward Scissor Gloves. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that one's good. Uh, and if you couldn't tell by those references there, uh, we're, we're talking about a classic. Uh, we're talking some good old Wes Craven, uh, one of my favorite uh, horror movies of all time. The first horror movie I've ever seen in my life, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, but before we, uh, we dive into that... Uh, Freddy Krueger, uh, arguably the best slasher villain ever. Uh, there, there's, you can't really go wrong with Freddy Krueger. He's one of the best, if not the best. Uh, we, we all love Freddy. But there, there, there's a lot of other really interesting slasher villains out there. And let, let, let's take a second to, uh, let's take a second to admire them real quick. Because we're, we're just going to be stroking Freddy's cock the whole time. Uh, so, uh, before we begin, uh, what is your guys' favorite slasher villain? Uh, I am going to start with Mr. Tim M. Sullivan. Uh, I believe, uh, we'll, we'll start with, I, I think Austin has some expertise in this, but I, I definitely know... Tim, you've really got some expertise in this. Yeah, I've, I've seen a slasher or two here or there. Um, I think I would say my favorite slasher villain might just be one Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, Leatherface is, like, one of the, like, big kind of starting points of the slasher genre uh, like, before we had Michael Myers, uh, we, we had this guy who, uh, 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 you could argue he wasn't even doing anything wrong. They, they came into his turf, uh, and he was just trying to protect his house, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, but <laughs> he, he, he's, uh, the, you, you gotta, you gotta love Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's just, um, it's just the absolute stone cold classic uh the second one's real goofy and i love that one too but um first one is it's it's one of those movies that i didn't properly appreciate the first time i watched it but then when i watched it again like as an adult i was like okay i get it um and yeah leatherface swinging a chainsaw around at full volume uh is absolutely menacing and uh it's, uh, it may, he's, he's one of the greats. So, yeah. Leatherface. Back to you, Joe. Solid pick. Solid pick. Uh, let's move on. We're gonna move on to Mr. Austin Zweevelman. Uh, what, who is your favorite slasher villain other than Mr. Freddy Krueger himself? Uh, there is an aspect of this where it feels like you're on the playground arguing whether, like, Goku could beat Superman, <laughs> in my mind. Um, I do want to, like, reflect. I, I'm, I'm a film lover. I've appreciated some movies, but also uh, I want to prove once and for all uh, that fucking Darth Vader could beat Harry Potter's ass. <laughs> so I am picking uh, Death from the Final Destination franchise. Because <laughs> that's fucking funny as shit. Um, imagine the Grim Reaper watching Pee Wee's Playhouse and he sees the breakfast machine and he's like, you know what? Fuck teenagers in the 90s, specifically. I'm gonna do a bunch of Rube Goldberg machines and fuck these kids up. Death's got a sense of humor in that movie. Uh, so I, I just, I gotta say, the force of death in the Final Destination films. That's my fault. <laughs> Back to you, Joe. Uh, that, that, that is not only a unique answer, that's, uh, that's actually a really good answer. Uh, but yeah, uh, all good picks all around. Um, uh, that, that, my, when it comes to my favorite other than Mr. Freddy Krueger, uh, there's really only one answer because I, I'm just going to go down the list of the more iconic ones here. Um, oh, he's cheating. You got, 
<laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not cheating. I do have a definitive answer. I just want to run them down real quick and why I didn't pick them. Mm -hmm. Leatherface. Uh, he is a great slasher, but Tim already picked him. Uh, Jason. Uh, he doesn't have too much of a personality for me to really like him, but he's got at least something. It's better than Art the fucking Clown. Fuck that clown and fuck those movies. Uh, and, but the Friday the 13th movies, they're all garbage, so I didn't go with him. Uh, Michael Myers, he is a great concept, but he is a great concept for one fucking movie. Uh, so I, I did not go with Michael. Uh, that really only leaves me with two options. Uh, Pinhead or Mr. Chucky. And I don't even really consider Pinhead a slasher villain, because... That's, that's why I, I didn't pick saying, him. I was just say, Pinhead is more of a cosmic horror villain, so we're throwing him out the window. Uh, we're, we're going with the predecessor to my girl Megan. We're going with Chucky, baby. Uh, what, what, what's not to love about Chucky? Uh, he's a foul-mouthed uh, little asshole. Uh, a, a man who uh, used voodoo magic to uh, put his soul in a doll, and he continues to come back and come back and come back. Uh, he, he has a wife uh, whose soul is also in a doll. Uh, he has a, uh, a gender-neutral child that has two spirits. <laughs> one a man, one a woman. Uh, that leads to a great Ed Wood reference. The man fucking becomes president at one point. Uh, the, the, the Chucky franchise... Uh, they, they, they know what they are. They start out just like kind of generic, ooh, like killer doll slasher. But then they just kind of embrace the concept uh, that, you know, this is a little fucking weird. And we, we've got like a really good character. He, he's got a personality. Let's just throw him in the weirdest shit imaginable. Uh, let's have him kill John Waters at one point. Uh, yeah, actually, I think John Waters is in that series twice, and he gets killed both times. <laughs> yeah, the, I, the, the child's. Yeah, I, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, I, I've only seen the first two uh, Child's Play movies, and I wasn't super impressed by them. But I do kind of want to watch the later ones where it gets extra goofy and leans into it. Mm -hmm. Once you get past the third one which is a little by the books, but it has maybe one of the more creative premises for a climax, that's when they start to get, like, really weird and out there. Um, and then the series takes that to a whole new level. Uh, but yeah, that's... Uh, I'll, I'll say this right now, just because we're just on the topic of it, fuck it. Uh, the, the climax to Child's Play 3, I think that might still be my favorite uh, climax to any of those movies. Uh, it takes place at a military school because that's where Andy's been sent off to. Uh, and the final scene is uh, they're out in the field and they're having a, a paintball gun war. And then Chucky switches out the rival team's guns with like guns with live ammunition. <laughs> oh. So you have one team with just pure like paintball guns. And then you have another team running around with live ammo. <laughs> it's now a uh... Baldwin set. <laughs> I'm cutting that joke, but I had to make it. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's a solid climax. It's very creative uh, for the movie that they're in. But yeah, no, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up my thoughts on the child's play thing. But yeah, uh, Chucky. Chucky's a great villain. Uh, he's my favorite other than uh, today's spotlight mr freddy krueger in the original nightmare on elm street uh we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna dive just right into this movie let's let, let, let's get into it please god this is god uh austin we'll start with you what are your thoughts on uh a nightmare on elm street directed by the late great wes craven r.i.p r.i.p i'll never forget the first time that i saw the nightmare on elm street movie uh, the first one, uh, I was 11 years old. I'd already seen, like, The Thing. I'd seen Saw. I saw Ghost Ship. I saw 28 Days Later. Plenty of spooky movies by the time I was 11. And this gave me the false impression that horror movies were all like that. Which is to say, more gross than actually scary. Then, one night, my best friend's dad was watching this on HBO, and we sat down to watch 
what we thought was going to be the corny origin story of the funny hat guy from Freddy vs. Jason, right? <laughs> and I remember after watching the main character's mom get pulled through a door thinking, holy shit, there might not be that much sleep getting done at this sleepover. <laughs> uh, in, in retrospect, that veil of false confidence uh, shattered for like a really big reason. Not all horror movies are scary. A good number of them are just fucking gross. I remember absolutely <laughs> crushing a Serbian film and Human Centipede 2 when I was in high school with my buddies, still pretending that I was building up some kind of like horror movie invincibility. But Nightmare on Elm Street isn't like the Saw movies. It's not like Hostel or Wrong Turn 2. Uh, it's not just gross. But believe me when I say some gross shit happens in this movie. <laughs> It's also really fucking scary. I had no idea before this most recent rewatch, but this movie has a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I'm inclined to kind of lean into that. This film is pretty fucking impeccable. Mm -hmm. And to add to the terrifying mystique of this movie, it's actually based off a true story. Uh, mm -hmm. Wes Craven based the story in this film off a new story he read in the LA Times where this Asian teenager kept insisting to his parents that if he fell asleep, he was gonna die. Uh, he even had a coffee machine set up in his closet like Heather Langenkamp's character does in this movie. And after several days of stressing out his friends and family, he finally nodded off when they were like watching TV. Uh, they carried him to bed thinking that like, this is all paranoid delusion that's gonna be fixed by a good night of sleep. But then in the middle of the night, they started hearing him screaming. So they ran over to his room, and by the time they got to him, he was dead. Ooh. And it gets worse. This wasn't a freak edge case. In the late 70s and early 80s, over 100 Hmong immigrants who came over to North America from Laos experienced this, uh, what was it, sudden unexpected death syndrome. Otherwise healthy people who die in their sleep out of nowhere. And after that window of time, the epidemic suddenly stopped. The exact reasons for why this happened are still a medical mystery. But beyond just how spooky the finished product is, A Nightmare on Elm Street is also one of those movies with a trove of fascinating behind-the-scenes stories. The, the most clickbaity of the bunch being, we would not have Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings without this motion picture. Uh, the producer, the head of New Line, Bob Shea, he gambled everything he had on Nightmare on Elm Street. There was this moment, just imagine yourself in his shoes, where all the funding fell through, everything was in jeopardy, and that weekend he had to fly to a conference to give a keynote on how to raise funds for indie features. Uh, but, but in the end, he got the money, and this film was such a lucrative hit for New Line uh, that on their Wikipedia page, like the history timeline, there's a whole section just named after this movie. Bob Shea gambled everything the studio had on this movie, and it paid off. And he'd go on to do something like this another time, say 15 years later, with this little-known director from New Zealand who needed almost $300 million to film a trilogy of fantasy epics back-to-back. -back. I think it bears noting that adjusted for inflation, uh, Lord of the Rings, the original trilogy, cost $500 million in today money. It's one thing to watch Jeff Bezos do that with Rings of Power, but New Line Cinema was not Amazon. And this film, this was the first time that Bob Shea went all in and he won the whole fucking pot. So next time you're doing a Lord of the Rings marathon, you better fucking thank Freddy Krueger. And I got more tantalizing behind the scenes stories and thoughts and shit about the movie that I hope to share during general discussion. But I'll leave off by saying Nightmare on Elm Street has some really surreal kills that were ahead of their time, a frightening villain based off some real-life scary shit, and production value that seems borderline supernatural the more you learn about what a fucking nightmare it was making this thing. If you're familiar with the, the luck, if you're only familiar with the lackluster sequels or the remake or the crossover movie, do yourself a favor, go watch the original. If there's a film that's good enough to buy six sequels worth of goodwill, it's this fucking thing. Back to you, Joe. Watch your mouth on those sequels. Uh, la lackluster is not a word I would use to describe Dream Warriors. We all like Dream Warriors, but what about two and four and 
five two and rocks. not three warriors. F fuck you, four is awesome. Two has its moments. Uh, the, the, the only one that I will allow anyone to poo-poo on is Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. Wait, that's uh, the best one. What are you talking about? I will fucking end you. I have the power, <laughs> <love. laughs> <laughs> I've gone full Tanner. <laughs> I, I, I now have a sound bite to add into this. <laughs> Tim! Well, what, what, while I lose my shit here, uh, why don't you, uh, why don't you go over your thoughts on, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street? Yeah, um, I think the first time I watched this, uh, I was either a junior or a senior in high school. Um, like, I kind of just started my journey of getting into the horror genre, because I wasn't really a horror fan, uh, when I was real young. Um, kind of started dipping my toes into that around 14, 15, and, um, yeah, this, this was one that I watched in high school, and I think, <clears throat> for me, um, out of the, like, the, the big three slasher genres, you, you got, uh, the Halloween, the uh, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street, I think out of those three, um, franchises, this movie might be my favorite movie out of all of them. Um, and uh, I, 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 that that statement might get some protests from people going, but what about the first Halloween, though? And uh, to that, I say, I do, I do respect the first Halloween a lot. I think it's a solid picture, and it's obviously a very important movie, and uh, there's a lot of great stuff there specifically from john carpenter's writing and directing but it's one of the movies i rate lower in carpenter's work this might be my favorite uh wes craven movie uh sorry scream sorry the hills have eyes i uh, love, love both of those movies but I, I think i just have to give it to freddie for this one um first nightmare on elm street is uh just a fantastic classic slasher um and it has what i want out of like this kind of movie like uh it has so many great kills like the one that i'll never forget is uh johnny depp's death where he just fucking gets eaten by the bed and his blood shoots everywhere uh it, it's so fucking cool uh, I love that that's his first movie role, is just getting eaten by a fucking bed. <laughs> uh, love that. Wes um, Craven just kept walking up to Johnny Depp and be like, uh, uh, so have you seen this movie called Haosu? Uh, we're gonna do something similar to that, but a lot more gory for you. Death uh, bed. <laughs> the bed that eats people. <laughs> Death bed reference. Uh, 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 on that set that day, Sir Patton Oswald. Yeah. I say sir like he's British. <laughs> who, who knows? Maybe he got knighted. Uh, he, he did that between Ghostbusters. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it has has fantastic kills. And, like, I think something that's always fascinated me about Freddy Krueger, even before I watched the movies, is, like, he has, like the like exact premise to be like a too terrifying to watch movie at a young age uh like he's a guy who kills you in your dreams so you're just never safe uh and i think i think that that just makes for a really strong premise um like i said this is definitely my favorite of the uh nightmare on elm street movies i do like two and three uh, for me, I think this is a franchise where just each one I like a little bit less than the one before it, but I, I do like those first three a lot. Um, if you are a fan of two, uh, I would definitely recommend checking out the documentary Scream Queen on Shudder. Uh, it goes into some insight on like the, that lead actor's story. Uh, it's re really fascinating. Um, but this movie... Uh, very good slasher, very good, uh, just kind of informative piece of the horror genre, and, uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about it here today. Back to you, Joe. Hell yeah. Love that we got a Scream Queen shout-out in here. 
Uh, yeah, solid documentary. Watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, also watch Nightmare on Elm Street 2. It's not perfect, but uh, if you watch that and the documentary back to back, I think you'll find something to appreciate in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but l l let's get into my into my uh, analysis, if you will, of a Nightmare on Elm Street. So I, I, I may be a little bit biased with this movie because, as as I stated earlier. Uh, this was the first, like, genuine horror movie I ever saw. Um, I was maybe, uh, 14 years old when I saw this for the first time. Uh, this was, uh, my mom's favorite, uh, horror movie. Uh, she had the entire box set collection of all of the, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movies. She's had, she had them for, like, a really long time. Uh, <clears throat> and there was... A particular movie coming out around the time that I uh, watched it for the first time called A Nightmare on Elm Street, starring one Rooney Mara, though she wishes her name was scrubbed off that fucking thing, and I can't say that I blame her. Uh, but uh, I was very curious about the remake uh, and uh, lived to regret it. Uh, but my mom was thinking of taking us to go and s to take me to see it at the theater. And she was like, hey, do you want to watch the original Nightmare on Elm Street with me? And I'm like, absolutely I would. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, we sat down, we watched it. I've never been the same since. Uh, and it's probably why I will forever hold Freddy Krueger so high, because eh, it's just kind of a special memory with me and my mom. Uh, my thoughts on the movie overall? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's fucking great. It's easily the best of like these 80s slasher movies uh so, sure you, you can pick this movie apart uh there's a lot of dated effects in this movie uh when, when, when freddy krueger's like stretching out his arms you can see where the effects like happening like you, you can see where the pulley's hiding this might uh, be one of those movies like uh the evil dead and uh the thing where the ideal viewing experience might just be on VHS. Uh, just just to hide some of the, uh, the little bits. I, I, you know, I don't know if I'd go that far. I think knowing that's, that it is an effect um, kind yeah. of gives it a bit of a charm to it. it. That That is fair, too. Like, I do, I do appreciate, like, seeing the artifice of it. But, like, if you want to get fully immersed... Uh, either yeah, I, either either a VHS or like a real scratchy film copy. I was gonna say I'll I'll throw this thing into Premiere Pro and I'll make a a real rough looking thing to really hide the effects for you. There we go. Uh, there we go. Uh, but yeah, no, sure. Some of the effects are a little dated. Uh, the the arms, as I mentioned. The fucking blow-up doll that Freddy pulls into the window. Uh, it, it, it's very hard not to laugh at that. Um, sure, some of the acting is a bit hit or miss. Uh, the, the mom's performance in this is genuinely fucking terrible. Uh, Heather Langenkamp, uh, God bless her soul. Uh, she gets better as the, uh, in the later films that she's in. And just as an actress in general, but... Yeah, she's not really that good in this movie. Uh, uh, the, 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 it, it could be a bit better there. Uh, we like let those those little like tiny things aside. You've got a pretty solid like little. Uh, I, I don't even really want to say little. There's a lot of big concepts in this. Uh, uh, you, you got a solid uh, slasher movie out of this with a pretty creative premise. Uh, really big and ambitious special effects for the time. Uh, Fre Freddy Krueger, played by the great Robert Englund, uh, is fucking great in this. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I genu I, I'm hard pressed to say this is the only time where he is uh, in the franchise, genuinely like these, like at peak scary, because uh, because mm -hmm. he's not like quippy Freddy yet. He's not really throwing out quips. Uh, he, he's pretty fucking creepy. Um, the scene that I always reflect on at, like, the creepiest fucking moment in that movie with him. Uh, it's the second time he's, uh, terrorizing Tina before she dies. 
uh, and it's like he pulls off his regular glove and just like chops off some of his fingers. Mm. And uh, that that scene sticks out to me specifically because that's just like th- th- this fucker doesn't give a shit what he does to his own body. What the fuck is he gonna do to you? Like the genuinely creepy ass shit. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, I love jokey Freddy, but like th- 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 there is something to say about your horror villain being like a genuine threat and genuinely scary too mm. um, yeah. uh, th- th- this is why 3 has the best balance where it's like he gets to be silly but he's also still genuinely terrifying uh, but yeah so- solid shit uh, from Robert Englund uh, the New Line Cinema did not know what they had because they did not bring him back for the second one initially uh, yeah, that's a that's a fun story to get into. They they thought they didn't need Robert Englund. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Uh, here, fuck it. I'll dive into it real quick. Uh, they they uh he wanted a little bit more money to return for the sequel, and they didn't want to pay him more. Huh. So they hired a stunt actor to play Freddy in the second film, and then about halfway through filming, they realized. We made a mistake. This is not working. We we, we need to get him back. Yeah. Baby, come back. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so they, they paid him what he wanted. He came back. Uh, and then uh, they, they built New Line Cinema with him. So the, the house that Freddy built, mm-hmm. as they often refer to New Line Cinema. Hmm. Uh, there, there's probably a lot more that I'll want to get into uh, later on. But... Uh, I'm looking at the time. I think it's probably a good time to uh, go to an ad break. Uh, he- here's an ad for whatever restaurant uh, Johnny Depp went to uh, when he got the food for the scene where they're talking on the bridge. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, we'll, 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 be, we'll be right back. This is it, Jennifer. Your big break in TV. Welcome to prime time, bitch. And we're back uh, with Bomb Squad Matinee. But before we dive back into A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, do you like art? Do you like movies? Well, we got the perfect thing for you here. It's called MoviePalette.com. And basically what it is, you get like a little canvas that has the primary color of every frame uh, as like a little strip. And it just through this entire rectangle it's every frame of the movie just the primary color of it uh tim's got one he's pointing to it it's he's got one for mandy uh tanner has one for the movie punch drug love uh i i don't have one to show off uh but uh you you could theoretically get one for a nightmare on elm street it wouldn't be like uh, the colors of Freddy's sweater, but you get you you'd probably there's a lot of good colors in this movie. You'd probably yeah. have a decent looking palette. Uh, but yeah, you'll you'll you can go purchase that at moviepalette.com. Uh, while you're at it, uh, use the code Squad15 at checkout. Uh, that way you can save fifteen percent on your order. Uh, and it also helps the channel, I guess. Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, but yeah, moviepalette.com. <clears throat> All right. Now uh, that the uh, plug's out of the way, uh, we're gonna just jump right into general discussion. Is there anything you guys wanna, you guys wanna tackle? I'll, I'll, I'll open the open the court to you guys. So you briefly alluded to um, the the 2010 movie, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, a couple things. First off, that is one of the only two Freddy movies I haven't seen. I also haven't seen New Nightmare, which I hear is good. I do want to watch that one. New Nightmare um, is really good. Uh, I, I am mildly, morbidly curious about 2010, but I've only heard awful, awful things. Uh, and also, I, I do like Jack Earl Haley as an actor. Like, I, I like the idea of him playing Freddy, but I, I hear it's bad. Um, he was riding high off of playing Rorschach in Zack Snyder's Watch, but everyone was yeah. very excited. I also haven't seen the remake. I've heard, like, the, the most common complaint I've heard is that they play up too much, uh, that Freddy is a chill mode. Yeah, uh, I, d- they, I guess made he that is. explicit in that movie. Uh, like, they, they were they were going for more implicit on the um, England movies. 
but uh, they were like, let's just make it textual. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, they they don't shy away from it being like, yeah, no, he is a chomo. Like the franchise, like it it'll dip its toes into the idea that maybe there's some weirder, like more creepy stuff going on, but it's never like directly like said in any of the movies. Yeah, uh, the, the remake just flat out fucking says it. Yeah, um, um, and, and it ruins the movie. I'm kind of interested to see how that works. Yeah, that that's that that's the thing. It's like, I I think the one of the major issues with the Nightmare on, on Elm Street remake is um, it it takes itself way too damn serious. Ah. Um, especially for a movie with a premise of guy tries to kill you in your dreams. Yeah. Um, it, it takes it a little too serious. Uh, I... I, I did want to like bring that up though, uh, mostly because I remember when you and I were in the Grave Tales class at Webster. A uh, friend of the channel, former Bomb Squad member Devin Dillon, was also in that class, and like he was talking about how uh, like everybody hates the Nightmare on Elm Street remake, but I remember really liking it. And then like during that class, he rewatched, and I was like, "Oh no, I'm crazy. That movie fucking sucked." Damn. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, no, it's it's not a good remake. Uh, uh, maybe not the the worst of those like Platinum Dunes uh, produced by Michael Bay era remakes. I I still think it's his Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. I genuinely don't like that movie. Uh, the Friday the Thirteenth remake though is great <laughs> um, because that movie. Uh, it's uh, your, again. Your, your, your tits, tits are, are stupendous. stupendous. <laughs> In stereo, I love it. Yeah, um, yeah, that 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 remake. Yeah, it looks a little bit more serious, uh, but no, that movie is not serious at all. It practically knows what it is. It's just another dumb Friday the Thirteenth movie, there, and it just kind of rolled. It kind of rolls with it. There's there's a guy in that movie who just to fuck with somebody's just he just goes just because I'm black means I can't like Green Day. I'm just kidding. I like rap. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. Uh, but let, let, let's get back to uh, let's get back to Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you guys got anything? I, I I might tell my Robert Englund story later. I've got I've got a couple stories. Um, so I I listened to both of the commentary tracks that are available for this, and to my surprise, they saved the craziest two stories for the end of the crew commentary of all things. <laughs> and they both involve a person that I have never heard of before. Okay, have either of you ever heard of a person named Sarah Risher? No. Not. She's got a cool IMDb page. She co-produced on a few John Waters movies, all the Elm Street movies, Pump Up the Volume with Christian Slater, of course, uh, Surf Ninjas. Um, but this lady, the co-producer of Nightmare on Elm Street, she saved the movie from ruin. Twice. Okay, here's story number one. So, Sarah was pregnant while this movie was in production, and when they got to post, one night when they were, like, mixing the score, she started going into labor, like, in the studio. So they get her to a hospital, right? And she's having a whole baby. Hours later, while this is happening, the music supervisor, air quotes, that they hired actually, like, dipped with Bernstein's paycheck, the composer for this film. The whole second half of what they were going to pay the composer, the second half of what they owed him, this dude just fucking took it and left town. <sighs> so, naturally, uh, Bernstein just tells the production straight up, uh, I won't release the score until I am paid the rest of what I am owed. Uh, but they had no money left to pay him with. And the score is really important for this. They need it for the movie. And it's coming out soon, right? Uh, this led to Robert Shea having to call up Sarah two hours after she had a baby and beg her to call Bernstein and fix this whole thing. She was doped up, she just had a baby, and she had to save the whole fucking movie with just a phone that she had at the hospital. In the end, she calls up Bernstein, and get this, she convinced him that he'd get paid later on the hypothetical grounds that the movie did good. 
literally convinced this man to be paid in money that might never exist. That is some 1980s high-level producer bullshit right there. Yeah. And uh, the second Sarah Risher story, this is, I want to see the look this makes on Joe's face. It's a little bit shorter, but, but you work at a movie theater, right? Um, oh, boy. <laughs> so uh, this happened one month later. They released this movie on a Friday, and they immediately got reports from folks that the movie was too dark. No one could see shit. Um, so Sarah strapped her baby to her chest, her one-month-old little baby. <laughs> And she fucking walks down to a theater in Times Square near her fucking place where she lived. And remember, this is New York in the mid-80s. So Times Square was a scary fucking place to walk around with a one-month-old baby. She bought a ticket yeah. to the screening, and she was shocked to see with her own eyes that everybody was right. The picture was way too fucking dark. You could not see shit. Now... They colored Time Nightmare to be kind of dark, but not, like, imperceptibly dark. So her and this baby, they busted upstairs, barged into the projection room of a mid-80s Times Square movie theater to ask the projectionist, excuse me, sir, what the fuck is happening? And after squeezing the guy for information, uh, she found out that all across America, projectionists were actually showing movies at half the candle power just so they could save on replacing bulbs. This oh wasn't going to be just like a Times Square issue. This was going to happen all across the country. So, Nightmare, which is mostly just at night, needed to be uh, recolor timed. They had to brighten up all the prints that they released after that date in order to fix this issue. Um, but yeah, none of the, no one would have been able to figure this out in time had this lady with a one-month-old baby not barged into the middle of, like, 1980s crime New York and like fucking, you know, in interrogated a projectionist. This lady has balls, okay? Fucking Sarah Risher is an industry legend, in my opinion. Hell yeah. I uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's why we have, uh, codes on our projection room doors now. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, uh, it's under lock and code. <laughs> no one can do that now. Uh, Someone, uh, I'm not going to name names, uh, but s someone in St. Louis really wanted to. And th they're big in the film scene, but I'm not going to get into that. Wait, uh, <laughs> wait, are the codes in reference to, like, adjusting the light's brightness? Or that's no, that no, no, there, there's a code on the door. You could not, like, barge upstairs to talk with me. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> Sarah Risher might find a way, though. Uh, the, the baby, <laughs> the baby might find a way. Um, yeah, but, that, but uh, the baby will ahead. find a way. Sorry, um, no, you go ahead now. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> um, yeah, you you uh, you brought up something that I was gonna mention, which is that this movie has nighttime scenes that you can see. Uh, don't you love it, folks? Don't you love when you can see what's happening in the movie? Remember when movies used to have uh, key grips and people that like knew how to light shit? Remember and gaffers? Actually, remember <laughs> gaffers? <laughs> what was it? Remember, um, remember color grading? Uh, they 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 fucked up. Uh, the, this movie has a lot of lights and night scenes. Uh, they fucked up the schedule. They filmed this in summer. They started filming this in July, and they quickly realized what they'd done. They had, like, the least amount of night you could possibly have every night. Ooh. And most of the movie was night scenes. So they're on set, and they're like, all right, we're pulling an all-nighter. And they get, like, you know, six hours of dark. And they're like, oops. Oh, God. <laughs> and they can't, like, reschedule shit. Seriously, everything about this was an uphill battle. That's that's such a rare like reversal. It's usually we're burning daylight. It's now it's uh, we're burning moonlight. <laughs> God. <sighs> uh, let's see. What, where are we at time? Yeah, you, uh, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, we're, I I might as well just get it out there. Let, let let's tell my Robert Anglin story. Uh, let's I, go. I, mean, I just want to. Uh, I'll, I'll get it out of the way. It's it's pretty quick, and I, I don't have anything mean to say about this man. So if, if you're expecting Freddy Krueger's an asshole in real life, no. Uh, that, that That's not what this story's gonna be. Um, but I was at I think, oh, yeah, it was almost ten years ago now. Um, almost ten years ago, I was at a convention out in Des Moines. Uh, I Iowa. Represent, baby. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> 
but I was at, at a convention. Uh, they had a Wizard World, which is now Fan Expo, uh, just uh, out in Des Moines. They don't do it anymore. They, they used to have one in St. Louis, too, but they don't do that anymore either. Um, but I, I was there for the whole three days. I stayed out in Des Moines. I had a hotel. I was having a good time. Met, met, met some fun folks. I met Lando Calrissian. I met uh, Ernie Hudson. Uh, I met a lot of cool people there. Uh, but last on my list for that entire weekend uh, was Robert Englund. And Mother's Day had happened maybe a few weeks before the convention, and I didn't have anything for my mom uh, for Mother's Day that year. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, if Robert Englund's here. Uh, and I remembered, oh, it, the, the, the Nightmare on Elm Street was uh, the first horror movie I ever saw, and I saw it with my mom. I, I'll, I'll go get his autograph uh, from him for her. Uh, so I went and I bought um, an art print that was being sold at one of the booths uh, that someone had like custom made and they made like prints of it. I grabbed it, uh, paid paid money for it, and I got in line. <clears throat> and it was a fairly like <clears throat> decent like length of a line. And normally I'll say this about conventions: if you've ever been to a convention before, usually by day three. Um, if the celebrity is there all three days, uh, you can uh, usually tell that they are ready to go home. Because, yeah, be being at a convention for three days, it can be exhausting. Like, ha having spent three days at a convention, I want to go home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> th th there's, there's only so much you can do. Uh, um, I usually attend conventions to, like, take cosplay photography. And Sunday of the convention, everybody's just in their most casual, just like... Yeah, this is Vegeta in the pink shirt he wore for a few episodes kind of <laughs> costume. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it's it's the same thing with celebrities. You can kind of hear they're starting to get tired. They want to go home. Not the case with Robert Englund, though. Because he waltzes in. He, he says hi to everyone that's in line. There's not that many people. Uh, but he says hi, uh, does his little intro, and they start the line and he, he's having a good time he's still wide awake and then I get up to him uh, shake I shake the man's hand and I'm like oh hey how you doing he, he's like really excited to meet another fan and he looks at this art print he gets excited about it um, I, I tell him that it's for my mom and I tell him my story with the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise he gets really excited about that like he, he like took the time he like he wanted to know more like and that's the same thing he did with every other fan there, too. Like, he took the time to listen. He really wanted to talk with his fans. Uh, <clears throat> and then at the end of every, like, encounter, he would recommend a movie to someone. For me, he recommended... Um, it, it was a movie called Mother's Day. It wasn't the... Uh, it wasn't the trauma one. But it was a movie called Mother's Day. I, I, I did eventually watch it. Um, it's been forever since I've seen it. I thought it was fine. Uh, but I appreciate the uh, the recommendation, Robert. Uh, and yeah, no, he, he was a really solid dude, uh, which is more than I can say for some other celebrities uh, that I've met at conventions before. Like so, some of them can be kind of dicks. Uh, the Mystery Science Theater guys don't like them. They're kind of mean. <laughs> uh, Hate to uh, see hot, it. Hot, hot, hot take. Uh, they, they they weren't like terrible. They but they were kind of dicks. Uh, I, I don't know if it was just misreading of sarc uh, their sarcasm or they were just being dicks. Uh, and not, not the best encounter. But Robert Anglin, really cool guy. Um, and surprisingly was not starstruck by him. Now, Tobin Bell, on the other hand, that, that man freaked me the fuck out. <laughs> oh, really? Was so, he so, wearing yeah, the, the backwards hat? <laughs> so, so, so here's the thing. It's like a saying that I've had about conventions... Uh, is uh, when the second person that is, like, famous that you've ever met in your life is Stan Lee, you can pretty much handle anybody. And I still, like, stand by that statement. Uh, with, with that said, when I met uh, Tobin Bell a few years ago, um, like, I, I was treating him like it, I would any other celebrity. I had talked with other celebrities at that convention for, like, extended periods of time. So I was like, okay, I, I've got a groove. I, I've got things going on. And then I see the man. And he just looks like he does in the movies. And then he talks exactly like he does in the movies. And I was just like, oh my fucking god, this is scary as shit. 
God damn. You just Daniel Day Lewis your ass. <laughs> yeah, I it was one of the like he, he seemed like a really nice guy though. I, I I feel bad, but I was just like kind of frozen in fear. <laughs> uh because yeah, it was just he talks exactly like he does in that like that that's just how he talks. <laughs> And it's it's like one thing when it's Robert Anglin and he's like covered in makeup, uh, like at the convention, it's just Robert Anglin as he is. So it's not like you're seeing the Freddy Krueger. Um, it, it, it's just a nice guy. And then you see yeah. Tobin Bell. And it's like, no, you've seen his face on the screen. He is going to kill you. He just comes yeah. up to you and he's like, Joseph, <laughs> you're a smoker. And your heart just drops. You're like, what? And he's like, I saw you outside. Can I bump a pack, please? He's <laughs> getting exhausted. Yeah. Oh, my God. I I uh, haven't met a lot of, like, horror celebs. I'd like to meet more. Um, I, I think I've met three, uh, two of whom were on sets that I worked on. Uh, Debbie Roshan and um, Bill Mosley. I'm on, like, a first-name basis with Debbie Roshan. She congratulated me on my engagement. Um, nice. But uh, then the third was Felissa Rose uh, when she appeared at the Alamo earlier this year. And she was fucking sweet as hell. Uh, like she, she just She's she coming just, back. Yeah, she just wanted to hug immediately. We posed for the picture. It was, it was great. She was sweet. I Yeah, I actually did not get to meet Felissa when we had her at the Alamo. Gotta meet her next uh, time. I do, yeah. Um, th they all went out, out out for drinks later, uh, and they didn't invite me. The bastards. I'm just kidding. They actually oh. did invite me. I, I I was just tired. I was working a running ship that day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but all, all of this is uh, the best stuff about a nightmare in Elm Street. <laughs> uh, yeah, Boston. Sorry. Oh, uh, this movie. Uh, this movie has something in common, if you could believe it or not, with Andre Tarkovsky's Stalker, uh, Dick Powell's The Conqueror. Is, is that the one where they all got radiation poisoning? This shit probably gave some of the cast and crew cancer. Uh, the boiler <laughs> scene in this room, the, the boiler scenes in this movie were filmed at the Lincoln Heights Jail, and after this movie wrapped, that specific part of the building was condemned because there was a metric fuck ton of asbestos in there. They found oh. out afterward. <laughs> Oh, so they no. weren't able to go back and film there for the sequels. Also, more danger. There is that, you know that little scare involving the millipede that crawls out of Tina's mouth, right? Yeah. That particular type of millipede is super duper fucking poisonous, actually. Oh. And the animal wrangler one day on set was like, huh, I misplaced my poisonous millipede. And so they had to be like, all right, everybody, break for lunch. And they all had to go on perpetual lunch while this dude kind of walked around the big old set looking for a poisonous millipede. Uh, Fortunately, nobody got hurt, uh, especially the millipede. He got, he made it out all right. <laughs> Everybody got to go on making the movie. But, uh, Jesus Christ. Yes, people almost got hurt. Oh, man. Uh, movies from the 80s. They don't make them like they used to. Some <laughs> In some ways, that's a good thing. In, in yeah, other in ways, ways, not that's so a much. genuine good thing. But in, in this specific <laughs> way, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just say it because I think it's funny. <laughs> Where this movie was filmed, this movie was filmed around Silver Lake, uh, with Nancy's house being 1428 North Genesee Avenue. Uh, the neighborhood was actually, in the 80s, considered to be kind of dangerous at the time, uh, which is why they let a bunch of nobodies with no money film a feature there in the middle of the night all summer, right? Uh, the neighborhood was so busted that the Condor operators were always worried they were going to get shot because they had to just sit up there with the the big-ass light and they would just kind of look around this creepy neighborhood at night and just be like, oh, God, someone's going to fucking get us. Um, but to add to the trashy nature of this shit, this story is nuts. So one day, the owners of 1428, Nancy's house in the movie, they were, like, out doing some shit. It was just the cast and crew. They were filming, and they hear this, like, knock at the door. And it was a fucking representative of the IRS there to inform them that they're going to have to foreclose on the house in 30 days if bills aren't paid. This dude insisted to the production that the sign he was putting on the door saying the homeowners owed the IRS 
needed to be on the door until those bills were paid. 24-7, it's illegal to take the sign down. So he fucked off. Everyone's fucking scared. And then the next morning, they show back up to set, and one of the grips just took the fucking thing down, and they kept on filming. Because fuck the law. This is New Line Cinema. Uh, but, but yeah, they didn't lose the house. I, I guess they paid their bills. This, this was a weird set. God damn. I think that's, speaking of the house, I think that house is not too far from uh, the Michael Myers house. Oh. Uh, but, but then again, the, the Michael Myers house has been, like, physically moved, like, a ton of times. So I, I don't think it was originally there, but I think it's there now. So it's not too far from uh, uh, Nancy's house in A Nightmare on Elm Street. So you're saying um, that evil continues to change shape. Exactly. Uh, and evil will <laughs> die tonight. Evil <laughs> dies tonight. Evil dies tonight posting evil in the Freddy Krueger episode. <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, uh, we still got some time. Uh, did, do you guys have a particular favorite kill in this one? There, there, there's some pretty good kills in this one. Um, I, I did mention the bad one. Uh, that, that one's a stone cold classic. No! 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 I also I'm a big fan of the first one where the girl's just getting like carried onto the ceiling and torn apart. Uh that yeah. that one's incredible. <laughs> Those, those two are the the standouts for me uh no 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 competition i was floored when i saw young johnny depp turn into a geyser of blood and it's <laughs> I, I i've always respect people who build sets that rotate like i i can't believe mm. that we've come far enough that like they're doing it on television now for shit like euphoria but it's so crazy that this movie where everyone who talks about it they're like yeah we had no money we made this for scraps. I paid people in Smarties. Like, fucking, uh, they managed to build a set that rotates. They had to, like, for the, the, the there were, like, fucking certain things they couldn't nail down. You know how they got them to stay still? They just fucking sprayed that shit with hairspray. They got it rigid. That is so, it's amazing that they made everything rotate. Actually, dude, for the blood scene. So, um, when all the blood came down, there was circuitry involved with some of this. Most of it was hand-pushed, but there was some electric shit like running the lights. So, it short-circuited all the fucking wires. Everyone, like, after they got the shot, everyone thought they'd all been electrocuted. They were like, wait, okay, am I alive? <laughs> um, but there was blood all over the fucking studio floor. And they were just, like, so fucked up by what had just happened that they just kind of, like, they all left. They were like, holy fuck. And, um... So, in the middle of the night, one of the producers was uh, gets a call from, like, the guy who runs the studio. He's like, hey, what is this? What, what did you do here? Why is there blood all over the fucking studio? And uh, so, this producer was like, D hold on, I'll fix it. And he goes to his 16-year-old son, and he's like, hey, Johnny, how would you like to make 30 bucks? And he pays his kid minimum wage to spend all night mopping up the studio. <laughs> so, they could film there at 6 in the morning. It was fucked. Jeez. Christ. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, death bed the bed that eats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you know, yeah, it's hard not to pick either one of those two because yeah, like how how can you not? Uh, honestly, if I had to pick, if I had to pick one between those two, I, I'm going with the the one where Tina's floating up. That because that shit is not only impressive by '80s standards, it's just still fucking scary yeah. today. Holy shit. Yeah, like it, uh, you're saying, you're saying with, Tim. with with just this movie, I think it's gotta be between those. With the franchise as a whole, you do have to account for "Welcome to Primetime, Bitch." Uh, yeah, that, that one's incredible. <laughs> yeah, the, the kills do get crazier in later movies, uh, from what I've seen of clips on YouTube. Yeah, um, Fre Freddy kills Breck and Mayer with a power glove. Damn it! Got the power glove. 
but but in this one it's helped by the fact that he's just fucking this is god freddy you know he's he's a yeah. freak the whole time he's not joking yet they introduced him in the credits as fred krueger when i saw that <laughs> yeah. i will push my fucking glasses up i was like oh he's official for this one putting his best foot forward that fred krueger nice it's like it, 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 it's like that meme. It's like uh, when you're at the job interview, and then when he becomes Freddy, it's like when I'm at work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, is, is there anything else you guys wanna wanna discuss about this movie? We're we're about to hit an hour. Heather Langenkamp and John Claude Van Damme have one thing in common. Uh, yeah. They filmed their most famous movies while having a huge cyst on their forehead. If you have body image issues, just go and watch these highly famous films where the actor clearly has a cyst on their forehead and does not give a fucking shit about it. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, something that's once you've noticed it, you can't unsee it. Uh, so so much so that when uh, they they're, they have her strapped to the dream machine, like they put like one of the electrodes like right yes! on it just to cover yes! it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, and again, details like once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh I think we're at a good place to wrap up. Let, let, let's get into our final thoughts on uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. We had some fun talking about this movie. Uh, we'll we'll start with Tim. Tim, you go. Uh, movie good. Uh, I, I, I quite enjoyed revisiting this one. Um, favorite uh, of the like big slasher, the big three uh, slasher franchises and uh definitely check it out if you haven't seen it uh, or if it's been a while and you'd like to revisit it it is always just a solid time to watch uh back to you joe far out far out all right mr sweevelman take us home my man it's a horror classic that turned new line cinema into an indie powerhouse Without this movie, there'd be no Lord of the Rings, The Mask, uh, or my favorite movie of all time, Boogie Nights. Wouldn't exist about say, without Boogie this. Uh, between this and Scream, Wes Craven created a shitload of opportunities for the people who came after him. Also, this movie is among the list of staggeringly few good things that happened because of the Vietnam War. If you've got cash, go buy the new 4K from Warner Home Video, featuring a new uncut version with eight seconds of extra crazy shit. Check it out. Back to you, Joe. Real, oh, yeah. real quick, uh, since you mentioned that uh, this is responsible for your favorite movie, I have to at least acknowledge the feud between this movie and one of my favorite movies. Uh, oh, boy. The, the Evil Dead thing. Um, oh, yeah, New Life. Which, New Which lies we, of cinema. <laughs> yeah, we, we 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 talked about this more on the Evil Dead Two movie night. So uh, check out our thoughts on that there. But uh, dude, just had to bring it up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fun, fun fun times with Evil Dead. Fun times with Freddy Krueger. Uh, my final thoughts. Um, yeah, I love this movie. I, I love it. I'll always love it. Uh, faults and all. Um, I, I cannot hate this movie. Uh, mostly because of the special memories I have attached with it with my mom. Uh, but also, it's just a really well-made movie. Um, like, all things considered, uh, when you look into its budget. And when, when you when, when you take into account the ambition that's being thrown onto the screen for the time that it was made, the money that they had, it, it's very admirable and it is very impressive genuinely scary uh and it gave us the best slasher villain of all time there's no competition um and i will not hear any bullshit about how art the clown is actually the best fuck <laughs> you freddy's the best fuck that stupid clown do your uh, homework but yeah do your fucking homework <laughs> uh but you want to know who else uh, needs to do their fucking homework who uh, you, oh, oh. <laughs> the person watching slash listening to this uh, episode of Bomb Squad Matinee, thank you oh so very much for watching. 
Uh, before I get into uh, the outro, I'm trying to save her a little bit of time here. Uh, but it, I, I gotta make this announcement. It's not an easy one to do. Uh, but this is officially going to be my last uh, episode uh, as a regular of Bomb Squad. Uh, the, a, a lot of things have been kind of building up to this. Uh, specifically just this thing called life. Uh, it, it's getting harder and harder for me to be on these things, scheduling-wise. Um, and just, well, I, I've had a lot of life happen. Uh, I, I think uh, what's best for the channel, what's best for me, uh, I just go off. I'm, I'll, I'll still be a part of the channel. Don't, don't mistake that. Um, but you won't be seeing me regularly. Uh, it, it, it's kind of already been hinted at. I've not been on as many episodes lately, uh, but I, I, I think it's time we make it official. Uh, th th there's a reason for that. It's just because life's happening. Uh, I I'm just getting too busy. Uh, so you'll probably see me. Uh, like I'll have my own stuff coming out. I'll probably have like Let's Plays coming out when I have the time to work on it. Uh, it, it's easier for me to schedule things I can do on my own. Uh, but when I have the time, every few months or so, uh, I'll be back on these episodes. But you just won't be seeing me that often anymore. It's it's not fun for anyone, but uh, it, it's, it's just got to be something that has to happen. Uh, I've had a fun time being a regular on this show. I, I'll always love you guys. I will always love the show. Uh, but yeah, I got I got to take a step back. It sucks. Uh, <clears throat> but I love you guys, and I'm happy that I got to make one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, my last like regular episode as a primary member of the show. Uh, with with all that in mind, uh, let let's let's do the final outro. Uh, if you liked this video, go down uh, into the comment section and tell us uh, what did do you like a Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, do you uh, like the sequels to a Nightmare on Elm Street? Uh, and do you like the Terrifier and Art the Clown movies? If you do, leave your fucking home address. I want to fight you, motherfucker. <laughs> no, don't actually do that. Comment yeah. below. Let us know. <laughs> Dox yourself. <bitch>. <laughs> <laughs> And while, uh, while you're at it, hit that like button so you know how much you like us. Hit that subscribe button so you know how much, so we know how much you love us. Hit the bell icon so that way you can get updates on when we upload new videos. Check out our Twitch page. I started playing the new Silent Hill 2 remake. I love it. I'll probably be doing more of that here soon. I might be playing uh, some uh, Sonic X Shadow Generation soon, uh, since that's coming out. Fuck yeah, we're, we're, we're just bringing the Twitch back, baby. We, we gotta bring the Twitch back. Watch the uh, VOD of me playing Yu-Gi-Oh! for <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let, let, uh, go, go to our Twitch page, it'll be linked down below. Check us out on Spotify, you'll have the audio recordings of these there. Uh, check out our Patreon, which is most important. Because we have uh, special tiers. Uh, if you donate to our five dollar tier, that's that's the one you get the commentary tracks for, right? Yeah, you get commentary tracks for both. Hell, okay, cool. So you get commentary tracks for both. But if you just donate to the five dollar tier, you'll get the uh, commentary tracks. We just recorded one for uh, Jim Cummings's "The Wolf of Snow Hollow." That'll be coming out soon. Uh, we did one on Space Jam. We did one on uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, I'm trying to get them all together over the holidays, and we, we'll talk uh, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, maybe. We, we also uh, did you know. one on Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, oh! We, we don't have highlights for it yet, but we, we did do one, me and Tanner. I was not aware of that one. <laughs> me neither. But yeah, uh, they, they did a Sonic the Hedgehog one, and coming soon at some point over the holidays, maybe we'll have the highlights in January, Lemony Snickets, a series of unfortunate events, I'll be on that one. Uh, and if you donate to our $10 tier on Patreon, uh, you'll get uh, shoutouts in the end bits of these videos. 
which reminds me, uh, we got to give our shout outs. Uh, shout outs to the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Mr. Jason Secord. Uh, and then, of course, we, we got to shout her out, uh, Miss Ta Mrs. Tanya Richard Kraft. Uh, Tanya Richard Mom. What? <laughs> I think it's Tanya Tanya Nolbert Kraft. Oh. Tanya I'm just so used to saying Richard Kraft. Because I yeah. say Tanner's full name. Hey, hey, listen, we're, we're keeping this in. <laughs> because, oh, absolutely. You know what? <laughs> because it's very fun. <laughs> Tanya Norbert Craft. Okay. Tanya Craft. We'll just stick with that. Not Tanya Richard Craft. It's Tanner Richard Craft. Tanya Craft. Thank you for donating to the Patreon. We love having you. And we'll shout you out every time. Uh, stay, stay tuned. We got more episodes coming out. Uh, but yeah, it, this, this was a great episode for me to uh, sign off on. Uh, I, lo I loved being a part of this. Thank you for having me, as as always. And uh, I'll see you whenever I decide to uh, and have the time to come back. Uh, this place will always be like home to me. Uh, on that note, I, I say goodbye. Actually, you know what? Fuck it. Uh, I don't care what Tanner says. We're keeping this in. I, I'm ending it with this. <gasps> Peace. Peace, bitches. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I, I love you all. Peace, yeah. bitches. I haven't seen one of those in a while. Turn of the king. <laughs> <laughs> I took it across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.